Another important investment is strengthening our public service broadcast or PSB. Like libraries, PSB programs are also funded by our government, and indeed we see both as important public goods. They both help foster a knowledgeable people who are appreciative of our past, informed of the present, and prepared for the future. Madam Speaker, with your permission, may I display a few slides on the LD screens? I will also play a video later on. Yes, please. Thank you, Madam. The slide shows a few examples of PSB programs that have done well. Last year, some 4.4 million viewers tuned in to PSB programs on free-to-air TV. PSB programs offered online on sinmsm.com had 5 million views. So I thank Mr. Bayam King for affirming the importance of PSB and its role in building a Singaporean identity and fostering social cohesion. The government recognises the value of public service broadcasting to Singaporeans. <coughs> Excuse me. We have thus continued to support bringing PSB programmes to our people even after we stopped collecting radio and TV licence fees in 2011. We are also taking steps to enhance the quality of locally produced PSB programmes, a point raised by Mr Bay. This was recommended by the PSB review panel whose members were drawn from the community, the media industry and the academia. The government accepted the panel's recommendations last year and we boosted support for PSB with a 35% increase in funding with $630 million spread over the next five years. With the increased budget, the MDA has begun to roll out the panel's recommendations. It worked with the Media Corp to develop and test pilot episodes for PSB programs. This pilot testing enabled program concepts to be refined through a feedback process and we hope that this will result in more PSB programs that better resonate with viewers such as Mr Bay. MediaCorp piloted three episodes in October last year. Audiences in the studio and online voted for their favourite programme concepts and they also gave useful ideas on how to improve the programmes. After pilot testing and taking in the viewers' feedback, MediaCorp will be producing three full drama series later this year. Mata Mata on Channel 5, The Lua Garisan Out of Line on Surya and Veti Varai or Estate on Basantam. Mediacorp will continue engaging viewers on more pilot episodes. Besides engaging viewers for feedback, we need innovative ideas to keep good PSB programs coming through the pipeline. MDA launched the PSB Contestable Fund Scheme in July last year. And this opens up the PSB funds both to FTA and non-FTA broadcasters. We want to encourage a diversity of ideas from a variety of players. Mediacorp has been awarded funding under this scheme and we hope to see more non-FTA broadcasters participate. The PSB Contestable Fund Scheme also encourages broadcasters to deliver content on multiple platforms, thereby spurring them to be more innovative. It will take time, but we are moving towards a future where PSB content can be viewed beyond the FTA TV, on pay TV, on the internet, and our mobile devices. So it is quality PSB content on the go, anywhere, and anytime. Parts of the exciting future are already here, in February this year, MediaCorp launched Toggle. It's over-the-top OTT service. Toggle includes locally produced programs from MediaCorp's free-to-air TV channels. Viewers can access them on demand for free via the internet and selected mobile devices. Major national events will also be streamed live. In fact, the recent 2013 budget speech was streamed live on Toggle. Come August this year, Singaporeans will be able to enjoy watching the National Parade on their mobile devices. Mediacorp also plans to extend free local content over Toggle to overseas Singaporeans in the middle of this year. The increased PSB funding will also benefit the production sector as we reach out to a diversity of players to produce better quality PSB programs. This will help attract and retain talent, thereby sustaining and strengthening our local broadcasting and production ecosystem. However, Madam, we recognise that the TV industry is still dependent on advertising revenue. We thus see more entertainment programmes on TV as they are more popular with our viewers. But TV can do more than entertain. I believe it can play a key role in fostering knowledgeable people through a strong lineup of quality, informative and educational programmes. Hence, the government will invest another $182 million over the next four years dedicated to supporting more locally produced documentaries and current affairs programs. We currently have a few good informative programs on TV. So for example, we have Channel 8's Tuesday Report and the Channel News Asia's Insight. Singaporeans can look forward to more of such programs as we ramp up production in our four official languages, English, Malay, Mandarin and Tamil. 
These programs will cover a wide variety of issues such as our culture and heritage, the environment, and public housing. One example of the type of quality local documentaries that we want to see more is History from the Hills. The video shows a trailer of the program which was at Media Corps Octo earlier this year. The program recounted the history of our nation through stories revolving around the Bukit Brown Cemetery, starting from the first grave dated 1833 to the closure of the cemetery in 1973. It sheds light on our past and brought to life important pieces of Singapore's heritage. Madam, with the additional funding, we hope to bring more of such insightful and interesting programs to our people not only to inform and educate, but also to inspire our people to pursue and fulfill their dreams. Madam, I will now address other issues that Mr. Zaki Mohammed has raised, which relate to the government's approach towards content regulation. Our objective in classifying content is to enable consumers to make informed choices. Through classification, we get to enjoy a vibrant media scene with a wide variety of choices to suit our needs when we turn on the television or go to the movies. At the same time, we ensure that our young grow up in a safe media environment with parents helping to guide them in making the right choices. Classification is not the job of MDA alone. We have to consider the views and the needs of our society. So MDA takes a co-regulatory approach. It actively consults the industry and the community in developing content guidelines. This process gives MDA invaluable insight into our people's diverse views and sentiments even as we come together to shape our common space. Industry co-regulation is not new. It has long been the practice with the broadcast and print industries where the industry takes responsibility for ensuring that the content adheres to MDA's content guidelines. I would like to take this opportunity to affirm the importance of our partnership with the industry and the community. Building on that, I'm pleased to announce that we will be introducing co-regulation for videos and the arts. She's smiling. First, under a new video co-regulatory scheme, video distributors will be able to self-classify videos up to PG-13 rating. This will facilitate industry growth. It will also benefit both video distributors and consumers as new video titles will be made available faster. As more than 70% of the video titles the MDA currently classifies are PG-13 and below, the potential benefits are substantial. At the same time, I would like to assure Mr. Zaki and honourable members that safeguards are in place to ensure that these self-classified videos will be in line with the existing content guidelines. Only qualified content assessors will be allowed to self-classify content. And I'm pleased to say the MDA has worked with the Workforce Development Agency and the Singapore Media Academy to train content assessors. So far, 50 content assessors have been trained and this will facilitate the rollout of the scheme when the Films Act is amended to cater for industry self-classification. Secondly, we will also introduce co-regulation for the arts. Currently, all arts performances are classified and licensed by MDA on a per-event basis. But for a majority of arts performances, this will no longer be the case with the introduction of the two-tier term licensing scheme. I'm pleased to announce that all arts groups will be invited to join the Tier 1 term licensing. Tier 1 groups will be able to self-classify performances that fall under a general rating and which do not have racial, religious, or political content. This will cover the majority of art performances in Singapore, up to 90% if we go by the performance classified in 2012. Arts, arts groups will be able to stage as many performances as they want during the one-year license period, and the license will be renewable. Furthermore, they need not pay licensing fees to MDA for self-classified performances. Even as we empower arts group to self-classified content, term licenses need to exercise this function responsibly. Arts groups need to provide accurate classification ratings and consumer advisories so that the public can make informed choices. Given that classification is an important responsibility that needs to be exercised with care, all Tier 1 term licenses will need to furnish a $1,000 performance bond signed by a guarantor. There is no need to make an upfront cash payment. Going one step further, Tier 2 term licenses will be able to self-classify all performances up to the restricted or R18 rating, the highest rating for arts performances and events. Because they can self-classify performances that deal with potentially sensitive issues such as race or religion, Tier 2 arts groups need to have an established 
track record over three or more years in order to qualify. This involves adhering to license conditions, being consistent in providing the necessary consumer advice in publicity materials, and being responsive to content community feedback about potentially controversial content. The qualifying criteria for Tier 2 term license that I've just outlined are not meant to discourage any arts group from participating in the scheme. The criteria are meant to set a minimal benchmark for self-classification to be done in a responsible manner. Madam, we target to amend the Films Act and the Public Entertainment Meetings Act early next year to provide for video self-classification and upstand licensing. Besides extending co-regulation, we will also be reviewing how we regulate content across the different forms of media. As I mentioned in my earlier speech, the Media Convergence Review Panel had recommended the harmonization of content regulation. The panel envisaged that the same piece of content would be labelled with the same age rating, whether it is delivered to the TV broadcast and film or through the internet. I agree with the intent to make our classification system more intuitive and helpful to consumers. We will take steps to harmonise content regulation across all platforms. Madam, I would like to address one more question from Mr. Bayam King. He asked if more local news articles from Straits Times and Daniel Chapao could be provided for free online. I'm afraid this is a commercial decision for the newspapers to make. Madam, to sum up, I would like to reiterate that the government is committed to fostering a knowledgeable society. We will extend access to library resources, equip our people to harness the power of information and provide quality PSB programs that inform, connect and inspire our people. In all our efforts, we are actively engaging and collaborating with industry and community partners, as I believe that collectively we can provide better quality public goods that meet the diverse needs of our people. Another point that was raised by Ms. Lowe on the leveraging the potential of the NGN, the NGN that is currently being deployed will provide nationwide ultra-high speed broadband access up to one gig to all physical addresses, including homes, schools, government buildings, businesses, and hospitals. With this network, Households and businesses will be able to access more information with rich content at a faster speed. More than 350 schools will tap into our network, which will benefit teaching, learning and assessment applications that may be bandwidth intensive. Consumers are also enjoying lower broadband connectivity prices than in 2009 when the NGNBN was launched. So with this, Madam Chairman, we'll move forward. Through co-regulation with video distributors and arts groups, we hope to encourage a more vibrant media and arts scene that will bring more choices and quality content to our people. 